Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and kick it off? Welcome everyone to our event. My name's Luke. I'm on DSA's National Political Education Committee, NPEC. And we're very excited today to be doing an event called Media and the Left, Past, Present, and Future. This is actually DSA NPEC's last panel event of the semester. So the last uh, panel event that we're going to have for this uh, year-long period that we've been doing. And so very excited to have this be our uh, last one of the year and to have uh, these wonderful guests. So what I'm going to do is uh, read the event description for us, and then I'll give us a little rundown of what today is going to look like, and then I'll introduce our guests and we'll get started. So as I said, this event is titled Media and the Left, Past, Present, and Future. At its last convention, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, created a single editorial board for its two publications, Socialist Forum and Democratic Left. And that was a change aimed at developing a, quote, prolific, democratic, and well-resourced media operation to serve our organization, our public outreach, and our political strategy. And in support of that resolution, one of the co-authors actually cited Tom Paine's Common Sense and the Black Panther Party's newspaper, Black Panther, as examples of how, and this is another quote, stories set our movements on fire. And I'd say we can also add William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator, the German Social Democratic Party's Newsite, and the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party's Iskra to the long list of very important dissident periodicals. So today, our NPEC event is going to examine media in the United States. We're going to explore a few questions. What's the contemporary media landscape? What political and economic interests have a majority voice and why? How did past left organizations like Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, think about media? How did they generate their material? And then finally, how should the left, including DSA, think about media? And why is it important for DSA to have this prolific, democratic, and well-resourced media operation? So uh, joining us today, we have Michael Crown. Michael is a member of Space Coast DSA and an editor of Cosmonaut Magazine and DSA's Democratic Left. We also have Carl Davidson. Carl is a veteran writer and political theorist. He joined the New Left in the 1960s, worked as a national secretary of SDS from 1966 to 68, and he worked at The Guardian. Today, he's a DSA member rooted in the blue collar realities of Beaver County, Western Pennsylvania, where he was born and raised. He's the founder of the online University of the Left and editor of the Newsweekly Left Links. And then we're also joined by Lee Arts, who has a PhD from the University of Iowa. Lee is a former uh, machinist and union steel worker, as well as a professor of media studies and director of the Center for Global Studies at Purdue University Northwest. Lee's published 12 books, including Global Media Diagnosis, excuse me, Dialogues, Industry, Politics, and Culture, Spectacle and Diversity, and the Pink Tide, Media Access, and Political Power in Latin America. Lee's also contributed to dozens of books and chapters and journal articles on global media, U.S. popular culture, media practices, and social movements. And Lee also speaks regularly on media, contemporary politics, social movements, and global popular culture. So we've got a great uh, slate of folks here to talk with us about media and the left, past, present, and future. What we're going to do is hear from um, first Carl for about 10 to 15 minutes, then we'll turn it over to Michael for the same amount of time, then we'll hear from Lee. After that, I'll pose a few questions to folks, and then we'll turn it on over to you, the audience. So at any point, you all can use the feature that you have down below, the Q&A button. Uh, if you click on that and then type in your question, it stores it, and I'll uh, read as many of those out as I can during the Q&A session. And I know uh, some folks have uh, PowerPoints for us too. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, 
enjoy a, a mixed media presentation. So without further ado, I'll turn it on over to Carl. Um, okay, thank you. Now, when I got this invitation, I was in the, in the middle of a deep dive into some of the theoretical questions about consciousness and media. Uh, so this fit right in. I hope I don't uh, verge too far into some of that, but I, I, I've i arranged this talk in uh, three three points I want to make. One dealing with the, the question of the what I call the mediated self, and the other is uh, talking about the uh, the new left in the '60s, and then finally uh, the the post '60s. Let's call it that after 1980. So to begin with, I'd say that uh, my starting point is looking at ourselves and understanding that ourselves are both social and mediated from the get-go. Uh, early on, our uh, internal generalized other expands uh, beyond uh, the personal I of our me, our met and uh, uh, the personal, uh, the generalized other being our imagined self of what others think about us, and expands in in, in different directions with other people. Uh, we can begin to see uh, how it develops with language and a, and a young child's interactions with family, but then it goes on through media from children's books and comic books. We watch Mr. Rogers, Sesame Street, Captain Kangaroo. We go to movies, study school books, engage with rock music on the radio, and so on. So in all of these, we begin to see that our self becomes mediated. We not only have direct personal uh, inputs into what uh, our self is, but it becomes uh, our uh, generalized other becomes inflated with all these inputs from media of different sorts. Uh, it also works the other way around. We can begin to create our own stories in music, and we can broadcast it out in simple ways to family, friends, and schoolmates. Um, but if we are not shaping our social selves uh, and creating our own narratives, our social orders, mass media is certainly shaping ours. And we can, of course, uh, be selective to a degree by what we choose from the supermarket of choices offered us we can what books we want to read what bands we want to favor what kind of movies we like which magazines we read or new shows we watch but in any case we if we are not shaping our own internal narrative about who we are the external media is doing it for us so when i first i'll use myself as an example um, when i first went decided to go to university I had uh, two dominant reasons to do so. First, I wanted to do well in physics and get a high paying job so that I could become a millionaire by age 40. I, I even uh, said that right out to my uh, 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 roommates in our, our dorm at uh, Penn State. But the other thing I wanted to do was hang out with the jazz fans and the people who had read Kerouac and other beat writers and poets. I didn't know, I knew next to nothing about politics of any sort. I was the farthest thing from a red baby, a red diaper baby that you can think of. But two things happened in the middle of my freshman year. First, I hated compuls uh, compulsory ROTC and I refused to take it. <laughs> and that put me in connection with the campus peace group. I hadn't even heard of them before. But then I was assigned the grapes of wrath in English. That was the second thing. I went to a, a rather poor working class high school that uh, it wasn't so bad, but the English department certainly was. And I had never heard of Steinbeck, even though I was in Penn State. And uh, so in English class, I was assigned the Grapes of Wrath. I was so taken by it that before the end of the year, I had read every book that Steinbeck wrote. Uh, I think there were about 10 or 12 of them at that point. And, uh, so by the end of the semester, uh, I was now connected with a, uh, uh, the peace movement, and and uh, and I had now had my saw myself because of the reading of Steinbeck and other things as a, a man of the left, and I started reading 
the Guardian, the New York Times, and also the Manchester Guardian, in which it was around back then. So all of that happened in just in one year. And at each point, media uh, played a big role. The peace, uh, peace uh, journals and pamphlets on our literature table and uh, the books that I had to read. In my, uh, when I moved to SES chapter at the University of Nebraska, I took charge of the literature table when I subscribed to all the left papers and I took on the task of internal education. So I ensured that we had a, a range of good literature on the table. In addition, I set up a, uh, what we called the Hyde Park Forum in the student union. And every week we would get up there for a couple hours and we would give speeches. And we, we, several hundred people would often gather around. Other people from other persuasions also gave speeches. It was kind of an open forum, but we used it as a way of presenting our views. Before, before long, our, uh, our SCS chapter got a memo machine and we started making flyers and pamphlets. And I wrote one called Student Syndicalism which I circulated at a, a SCS national meeting. And on the, I think on the strength of the title more than anything else, I got, got me elected to the SDS national office. So once I got to the NO, I had to figure out what I was going to do. So I, I took on the task of internal education for SDS nationwide. And we had our own paper, New Left Notes, but it, it was far too limited. And uh, it was far too expensive for us to produce in any, any uh, numbers. So what I did was um, I got to know Jack Smith at The Guardian. He um, would always come around to cover our meetings. And so I basically, uh, he talked about what he wanted to do with The Guardian. It had been originally had been the, the National Guardian, which was the organ of the, uh, well, not the official organ, but was close to the same thing of uh, the Progressive Party of Henry Wallace starting in 1948. But after the Wallace campaign uh, folded in 52, uh, it continued. And uh, it take, it had, uh, uh, when the Smith and a few others had joined the staff, it changed his political character. So he wanted to make the paper, the paper of the new left, especially SDS and SNCC. So I told him, I said, look, if you'll print uh, things that we write uh, sometimes, um, I'll get small bundles of the Guardians into all the chapters that I can. And so it was a done deal. And uh, and the Guardian uh, uh, had a, a tremendous impact uh, in uh, the student who left, but even it wasn't enough in, in terms of the upsurge was coming in all the major uh, campuses and centers of youth across the country. Uh, we also uh, created the underground, what was called the underground press, you know, from the great speckled bird in Atlanta to the rag in in, uh, in Austin, Texas, East Village, other all over the country, the underground press rose up. The part of the idea is that we didn't want to have anything to do with the bourgeois press. So we were creating an underground press as a kind of a counter institutions is the term we use for it. And once the underground press arose, then the Liberation News Service was created. They were in New York City, close to the Guardian, and we worked very closely with them, and the Liberation News Service served all of these un under underground papers. And in turn, uh, the articles both from the Liberation News Service and the underground press also made their way back, back into the Guardian. At the same time, with, uh, the Black Panther Party uh, came into being and eclipsed uh, SNCC. The Black Panther Party's newspaper also become a powerful role, and not just in the Black community. It began to be uh, circulated uh, in uh, more widely amongst the left and uh, and its, its articles also. But once SCS broke up, uh, all the fledgling groups of the new communist movement created newspapers. I worked uh, on several of them. I worked for the Call uh, of the October League and later the CPML. I worked for Unity, which was the League of Revolutionary Struggle. And in all cases, I mean, there were lots of others besides. Uh, and, and in all cases, basically, we use these newspapers as a, a means of uh, um, uh, using the ISCRA model. We use them to create factory cells uh, in, in all the various factories where we were concentrating to, to train up and make use of what we called worker correspondence. And we had all kinds of workshops 
uh, any workers who were interested in writing or who had stories to tell, we would work with them and help them train them in, in how to write articles for the newspapers, then we would print them. Uh, and in addition to becoming this uh, network that pulled together um, worker correspondence from around the country, we also used these papers as our public face uh, to, a more, uh, to have a more general impact. And uh, when the, later on, by the, uh, by the time in 1980, when the new communist movement went into crisis, all these papers uh, folded. And uh, the Guardian, however, managed to hang on until uh, 1988, uh, thereabouts. It had, it had a good 40-year run, but it finally um, got itself where it you know, was always uh, hanging by a thread, and uh, it finally became bankrupt at that point and, and couldn't continue. But the last part, uh, uh, what I want to uh, mention, is uh, uh, this kind of uh, media situation we face today. And to explain it, I want to uh, use um, a concept from Alvin Toffler, uh, what he called demassification. Toffler argued that uh, media existed in, in three uh, three uh, phases or, st or stages, you might think it up. The first was what we call one-to-one, -one, and that existed from the beginning of our human species up to the present. That's where you sit around and, and talk, uh, talk to your friends, or you hang out at a coffee shop or whatever. It's one-to-one -one communication. The second phase was one-to-many. Uh, this is, uh, you know, every, you could say it began with the Greek theater, uh, in the western part of the globe, um, and up through, uh, you know, the organization of uh, the revolutionary papers like Iskra, but mainly also the the, the national newspapers, the New York Times, and all that. You'd have a a small editorial group that was the one, and you would have millions of people uh, reading the paper, and that was the many. So it was a kind of one to one relationship. Likewise, with the in my younger days, we had. You know, there were only 11 channels on the TV knob, and only three of them were major networks. And uh, so uh, ABC, NBC, and so on. And um, so these also were uh, one to one to many forms. But with the invention of semiconductors and then transistors, a revolution took place in the, in the mode of communication. It was what we call, what Hoffler called many to many. So not only would you have one producer on one end and consumers, either one or many on the other end, in this phase, many to many, everybody could be either a producer and a consumer at once. And I think the most powerful example of it was the um, young African-American girl standing on the sidewalk while uh, George Floyd was being killed. And for 10 minutes, she uh, recorded the whole thing, sound and video both on her smartphone. And then she immediately uploaded it uh, to all her various outlets. And from there, it spread all around the world. So here she was. She wasn't, she was a producer as well as a consumer. And by now, the cell phone is practically ubiquitous, not only in the United States, but in, in China. Uh, I think there's 550 million smartphones and growing in China at the moment. Almost every young person in Africa has one. In South Korea, it's the most dominated. This is 100% uh, uh, throughout all of uh, South Korea. And uh, so this is a this is a new phase. And it's a, it's a cause for new forms of communication. I'll just mention a few that I experimented with. One of the first thing we did, or I did, I should say, a small group I was working with was we created what we called insight features. And we would write a, uh, you know, a series of articles, much like the old Liberation News Service. But when we sent them out, we put a five and a quarter floppy in them with all the articles on a floppy disk. And uh, so we were trying to uh, to have input into the regular mass media by doing our own uh, computer-based uh, insight features, which we also uploaded to uh, PeaceNet, 
uh, the the World Wide Web had not even been born yet. There, it was just all text. We also got a hold of uh, fax boards and a, a list of all the uh, newspapers, uh, fax machines in the city or wherever we were working. And whenever we were having demonstrations or something, we would send out fax messages to everyone. We set up YouTube uh, channels of our own where we would record certain things and we could with our smartphones and then we would upload them to our YouTube channel so that we were had, you know, our, you know, functional equivalent on a micro scale of, uh, of, a, um, of a TV station or so on. So these are some of the uh, things that were recreated. And since then, uh, I've gone on to, you know, myself to organize a, a number more. The online university, the left, was uh, uh, created as a uh, as a aggregator of all the interesting things on the World Wide Web that had to do with the left. You know, I guess tended to think of it as a if you look up into the night sky, you'd see a, a thousand points of light. I saw that uh, you look across the internet, and you could see a thousand points of light of interesting Marxist-oriented articles or uh, movies or whatever, and. So I found a, uh, create a web channel to aggregate them all and organize them along the lines of a university. So that's what the online university of the left is. But we also did have a newsletter, Left Links, that comes out once a week. I'll put the links to these in the chat where you can take a look at them. Uh, I created a publishing company where I didn't have to uh, um, buy a, a single ream of paper. And I have about 25 titles on it now. Changemaker Press, and uh, I, and because of the changes in the means, of produ uh, the mode of production, we're able to print these uh, with a print, uh, you know, a very minuscule print run, so that there's not stacks of books uh, sitting anywhere. Once, you, if you order a book, they print the book, and uh, that's that's the way it works. So. Um, there's a lot more to be developed by these. And I think that any left group today, I have to think of these through uh, in ways that go beyond what we did in the, in the 60s. But at the same time, I think it's absolutely crucial that TSA and, and, and any left organization that wants to develop in a serious way, that they have to have not only something that helps them build their internal organization, but they have to have a, a public face as well. So I'll end it there. Thank you, Carl. Michael, we'll turn it on over to you and you should be able to share your screen with us if you'd like. Awesome, awesome. And thank you, Carl. That was a very, very interesting presentation. I love hearing about the history of the uh, New Left and the Underground Press, very inspirational stuff. And my presentation, let me just um, get this started. All right. Share screen. Okay. Is that working? Yes. All right. So... I'm going to go back a bit further in history and look at the red media empire of the great Willy Munzenberg. And so Munzenberg is um, very interesting as a figure. I'm going to go through who he was as a person, why you know we're talking about him, what he accomplished, and um, I'm also going to go over what lessons we can learn from this guy for our modern day DSA left media. And um, now Munzenberg is interesting because he is kind of demonized by the right. Uh, Sean McMeekin, a right wing historian, wrote a book about him called The Red Millionaire, which just kind of um, portrays him as this insidious, subversive individual who um, pioneered many of the uh, techniques that the uh, the modern far left uses today to um, subvert our culture and spread its uh, degenerate ideology, as they would say. And um, so there is a bit of a mystique around Munzenberg and popular historical memory. And so um, who is this guy? 
Well, he is born to a proletarian family in Erfurt in 1989 as a works in a shoe factory. And he becomes involved with the radical left wing of the youth movement of what is at the time the uh, German Social Democratic Party. And um, you know, the German Social Democratic Party at this time is still officially an orthodox Marxist organization, but there is a right wing, a kind of center, and a radical left wing. And the youth movement is is really where a lot of the radical left wing of the party has its base. And Munzenberg, um, you know, he's um trying to organize apprentices into uh the free youth movement and gets arrested. So at the very beginning of his life, he's um kind of coming into conflict with the authorities. He uh decides to wander not just the country, but actually Europe, and um, he ends up in Zurich. And he ends up as an apprentice to an apothecary, and he falls in with another group of socialist youth and kind of falls in interest with anarchist ideas. But eventually, you know, these anarchists, they take it too far. They want to eliminate any kind of hierarchy or compulsion or discipline within their organization. And, you know, Munzenberg, uh, he, he comes in a lot of conflict with the SPD authorities because... um. You know, he's his um the youth keep his his youth moving. They keep going to jail. They keep getting arrested for their agitations, and the um older SPD bureaucrats are very annoyed by this because they they can't bail them out all the time, basically, and the, the youth movement doesn't have enough resources on its own. And so there's like there's a tension between the kind of radical uh you know youth movement and the uh, the bureaucracy of the SPD. And um, so he finds these anarchist ideas appealing, but he kind of um, falls out of the anarchist. And he uh, becomes a prominent youth leader in, uh, in Zurich with the, um, and he, this is where he first becomes involved in left-wing media as an official position with the youth leagues, Die Frey Jugend. And so, you know, Zurich is also where a lot of the uh, exiles of, um, the international left end up obviously Lenin is one of the most famous examples. And in 1914, World War One breaks out. Munzenberg um, condemns World War One, and he uh, gets to know Lenin and the uh, emigres around the Zimmerwald left, and um, he earns the respect of Lenin quite a bit and kind of becomes Lenin's guy. And um, he's um, you know the. Uh, the the red millionaire history, the uh, Sean McMeek and crappy right wing book, but you know it does have interesting information. He he says that Lenin is the only or Lenin comes to see Munzenberg as the only non Russian that he can trust in this circle, and I don't know if that's true or like how he comes up with the idea, but it, it does seem like him and Lenin become very close, and he's a very strong pro Bolshevik. Eventually, he gets um deported from Switzerland back to Germany due to all his anti war agitation and. Here's a picture of the Zimmerwald left who were, you know, these are the um, these are the leftists of the social democratic movement who oppose World War One and don't go along with um, the mainstream of the party supporting of the parties supporting World War. I. So in Germany, he gets involved with the Spartacus Bund. He's working with Leibnicht and uh, he organizes the uh, Spartacus uprising and germany in stuttgart and um yeah he's he's in the founding congress of the kp day and he's in opposition to rosa luxemburg's faction who are in favor of running for elections and participating in this national assembly that's forming so munzenberg is is very much part of the kind of ultra left left communist leaning wing of the kp day in this point and he's um and, and when uh and during the Spartacus uprising, he uh, gets imprisoned. He's working alongside Clara Zetkin for, um, you know, they have his mass demonstration calling for the formation of a true workers' government. And um, Spartacus Boone is put on trial, and Munzenberg is one of their uh, spokespeople. And he um, argues that it's, you know, they're being tried for their political beliefs and not their actions. And eventually he becomes acquitted. And he becomes a a chair for the KP Day, very important 
starts working his way into the important um, K payday positions. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the first big conferences Moons of Berlin organizes, a youth conference in Berlin, 250,000 people. And he wins a significant section of the uh, Socialist Youth International over to the common turn. And this becomes the Communist Youth International. He's uh, very much, you know, there's these 21 conditions that you have to um, accept to become part of the common turn. And Munzerberg very energetically is able to win, you know, the Socialist Youth International to these conditions. And, you know, he's in, very much on the extreme left wing of the common turn. He, uh, wants all reformist and nationalist tendencies purged so um he's very much about strong discipline the third congress of the common in 1921 he uh you know doubles down very much on this whole iron discipline thing and he um says that the youth movement needs to be completely subsumed to the national parties the youth movements you know kind of aren't crazy about this idea so this does kind of hurt youth recruitment and you know, then at this point, you know, he's a partisan of Moscow. He's a partisan of the Soviet Union, of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, and his idea of um, how they organize. And so he's all about hardcore centralism and iron discipline and following Moscow. And throughout his life, you'll see him move away from this position due to his experience in building a, a powerful left wing media. So and this is kind of where. Um, Musenberg starts building his, his red media empire, as I call it. And um, after the Third Congress of the Common Turn, Lenin puts him in charge of the International Workers Relief, the IHA, which is this mass international campaign to organize relief for the huge famine that is devastating Soviet Russia. And a mass or some mass organization, you know, we've got um communists like Clara Zetkin are, are very prominent. But, um, you know, Munzenberg, he's he's very good. He shows that he's very good, even from this early stage, at reaching out to non-communist intellectuals and artists, like Albert Einstein, um, George Gross, he's a famous Dadaist artist, um, very important in Weimar culture. He gets George Bernard Shaw, who's a more kind of a formist British socialist involved. And um, so... This, you know, he's he's building this mass campaign around um getting relief for the famine. And, you know, he's he's able to apply the United Front strategy very effectively through the IAH. So, you know, at this time, the uh, SPD and the mainstream Social Democrats are opposing this effort and tell their members not to work with these guys. But Munzerberg, you know, kind of goes around you know, the official higher bureaucracy SPD and gets SPD workers and members to get involved with this effort anyway. And uh, they do mass appeals to parliaments, grassroots organizing and cultural events. And it's all about raising funds to help the Soviets fight this famine, but also to raise, you know, the public image of the Soviet Union and, and to build support for the Soviet Union in, in sections of society that are not already um, interested in communist ideas, but might be sympathetic. And kind of grows beyond its initial role in um, supporting the um, Soviets under the famine into this big internationalist mass organization that's really able to um, create a media apparatus and a cultural apparatus that is able to seep into mass culture in a way that the Communist Party alone couldn't have. So... Munzenberg keeps the IAH relatively independent from the KP Day, and this allows greater flexibility and tactics and leeway and and finding ways to appeal to the masses that the um the um Communist Party's more doctrinaire leadership, quite frankly, wasn't able to do. They would um do these mass public debates where he would invite opponents of communism and the IAH to um you know, have debates. They started utilizing radio, which is very important, utilizing the most cutting edge modern technology, phonographs, making records. They would organize sewing circles, uh, children's circles. Um, film is a big part of it. So, um, you know, there's, there's a uh, 
a utilization of all of the, you know, of the most advanced technology to reach people, you know, in, in ways that um, a lot of other left-wing groups at the time might not have been um, keen to. And he has this big publicist enterprise, Neue Deutsche Verlag, and, um, you know, they put out more theoretical journals for IAH members, you know, but they also do this magazine called um, Workers Illustrated or AI, Arbeiter Illustrated or Zeitung. Um, AIZ, which is um, has a mass popularity beyond any other communist um, publication, and you know this, this magazine, Workers Illustrated, this is really a you know one of the most effective propaganda arms of the communist movement in, in Germany at this time. And one of the reasons why they're able to be so effective is because they get this very cutting edge and hip artist John Hartfield to work with them, and. Um, so they're able to really take a forefront and um, kind of um, this modernist aesthetic that's you know, I mean, form in Weimar. And this is um, I have a few examples of the art that you would find in Workers Illustrated. Um, here's some uh, anti-fascist propaganda that you would find in a Workers Illustrated magazine. Here's some other stuff. It's the kind of collages they would have. Here's some Goebbels burning books. Here's a Hitler, capitalist Hitler. So yeah, uh, so they're they're making mass publications to appeal to a popular audience that would other you know, that's kind of outside the communist circle. And they also get in the film. He has a film studio that's hosted in Moscow, and they have a bunch of they they publish for an international audience and. Have movies like End of St. Petersburg, Mother, Storm of Their Asia, Deserter. Um, his total media operation has a permanent staff of 200 people. But what they're really able to do is get freelance contributions from a wide range of different Weimar intellectuals. Um, got Karl von Ozitsky, um, a religious sculptor like Ernst Barlock, um, Ernst Taller, a big a uh, dramatist, independent socialist, a mystical writer, um, a communist poet, uh, the anarchist Eric Musham. So yeah, as we can see, you know, we're reaching out beyond um, the kind of doctrinaire communist circles and getting people from the kind of non-aligned left and even kind of from the, um, you know, non-conformist artists who are not communist at all, perhaps, but still sympathetic to a lot of the ideas generally being propagated. So you know, Munzenberg, you know, he's he's really good at reaching out to these kind of intellectuals and artists and getting them to support the cause without having to be disciplined by the Communist Party. Uh, and, and Munzenberg, he stresses his independence from the KPDA formally, but ultimately Munzenberg follows the common term line. And so this keeps him in good graces with the KPDA for most of... Um, the time he's doing this stuff you know and so they basically say all right you promote our message but you know stay within you know the uh stay within the confines of what's acceptable but you can still you know be creative and, and make alliances but you know as long as you are on message you know it's it's essentially fine and um you know this is the k-pay day they need Munzenberg just as much as he needs them because he's really good at, at, at um, you know, not, not just the Cape Eddie, but the common turn as a whole. Because he's really good at creating a public image, a positive public image for the Soviet Union. He's really good at seeping into um, mainstream society and affecting public opinion through his massive media apparatus that he's built. So they're willing to tolerate him having some level of autonomy as long as he's willing to kind of play ball with them. And the SP Day, the Social Democrats, they kind of compare him to right-wing media moguls of his time, which is funny because there's a Jacobin article about this guy that's that calls him the uh, the communist Rupert Murdoch. But um, you know, they accused him of basically being a capitalist, which is kind of true. He's able to sustain his financial empire through the income that he makes through these media activities. And so, but but in the end. I think uh, that's that shows a level of success. That shows that he was able to um, be financially solvent and create this huge media empire. Um, 
let's see. So, you know, he does these big conferences around, uh, you know, he does the Friends of the Soviet Union. There's the League Against Imperialism and for National Independence, where he gets people like uh, Nehru, Sun Yat-sen, Albert Einstein. They have two big conferences, and this is a big moment in the kind of anti-colonial communist movement. But ultimately, you know, a lot of these figures that are that show up end up turning on communism or going against communism. So it's a shaky united front. But nonetheless, it's still a big historical moment and getting all these different um, figures from around the world to, to, you know, to engage with each other. They do a conference in 1932 against war and fascism. And you got a lot of really famous people who come to this one. You got obviously you know, famous Russian like Maxim Gorky, but you, know, you got the Chinese Sun Yat-sen, you know, obviously Einstein's. Heinrich Mann, Upton Sinclair, Theodore Dreiser, John Dos Passos, Sen Katayama, Thomas Mann. And the Social Democrats are telling their people not to go. The authorities are trying to shut it down, but they still manage to have this really big conference. And, you know, it's a big way of um, projecting communism through mass culture at this time. But Hitler is about to take over and the party's about to end. Uh, here's a picture of... Um, Munzenberg with uh, John Ford and Garan Tiamoko Koyate, which is two important uh, figures. I think John Ford ends up being purged, actually, unfortunately. Um, here we have a big flyer for the Anti-Imperialist Conference. You can see a lot of the big figures that are there. All right, so Munzenberg is also uh, on the KPD. He's in the Reichstag as an MP, but he kind of keeps the internal politics more private. He's critical of Ernst Stalman's wing of the party and the social fascism line. And as you can imagine, his party activities make him more inclined to a more united front type policy. Because because of his relative autonomy from the party, he's kind of able to hobnob with like sympathetic SPD people. Well, someone like Thalman is calling them social fascists, et cetera, et cetera. So he's able to kind of uh, play this game. But uh, regardless, you know, he gets a lot of public criticism from dissident communists like Thalheimer and Brandler, accusing him of opportunism because of um, his kind of um, use of the United Front and, you know, hobgobbing of all these middle class intellectuals, I guess, is kind of seen by them as bit opportunistic and yeah like i said he does what he has to do to keep his operation backed all by the cape day while still maintaining his flexibility and they need him just as much as he needs them so the relationship does work out but after hitler is appointed chancellor munzenberg dips out to paris and he forms the uh, league against fascism and continues his propaganda struggle against hitler from France, they do a big defense for the communists convicted of the Reichstag fire, which they make into a big international event. They do a committee for the relief of victims of fascism. The campaign to free Ernst Thälmann, who is, you know, obviously locked up by Hitler, is a big one, as well as aid for the Spanish Republic. Uh, in 1936, the Great Purges are happening, and he kind of comes in the conflict with Moscow because they don't like how much independence he has. And they try to appoint him to a position in Moscow, but he refuses, and he gets outcasted by the communist movement. So he basically just keeps his media empire going, but independent from the uh, from the common turn. And while the Nazis are invading France and he's trying to escape, he mysteriously dies. And there's a lot of speculation about his death, which I'm not going to get into because I don't know much about it. But yeah, now for the lessons that I took from learning about this guy and his communist media empire. First of all is the, the importance of youth. I think that, you know, Munzenberg, because he got started in the youth movement and put a lot of emphasis on winning the youth to socialism and to the movement that he saw the importance of media as a way of reaching people and, and winning them to the politics of communism. 
think um, you know, Carl Davidson's presentation, you know, speaks to that in my opinion. And so I think, you know, the emphasis that he put on on media and building a media system was definitely related to his um his appreciation of the importance of youth. Organizational flexibility. Uh Munzenberg was able to have a lot of that organizational flexibility and you know, improvise, try new things. Um, you know, he wasn't under the strict bureaucratic centralism that a lot of the rest of the KPA day was under. So he was able to do a lot of stuff that the more dogmatic, doctrinaire communists probably would not have tolerated. Uh, don't be afraid to appeal to sympathetic middle-class intellectuals and artists. I think... Um, you know, there's a kind of tendency in, in in the left to think that any kind of, um, you know, communication to non-working class audiences is a waste of time. It's opportunism. It's it's not worth doing. But, um, you know, and reality is, is um, the, the middle class intellectuals and artists have an outsized influence in, in culture at large, which seeps down to the working class. And they have money. And you need money to run a really successful left media operation. And, you know, DSA with its budget crisis right now, I think, is learning this, you know, that we're going to have to find ways to make money and fund ourselves in order to do the kind of mass media we really need to be doing for building our organization. Use the most modern and up-to-date communications technology. You know, Munzenberg was always, you know, trying to use the most up-to-date mediums, even if, you know, it was seen as, oh, you know, workers don't listen to the radio, only the middle class listens to radio. Well, regardless, when the workers do start listening to the radio, we want to have a presence there. So use, you know, the technology that we have today. Don't, you know, stick to outdated technology. Take the advantages of all the modern day means of communications. You know, today we have social media. There's so much potential that the left could be using with social media and we're we, you know we're seeing the impact of that a lot you know look how many people are um, discovering uh, criticisms of israel and u.s imperialism on on tiktok sure it might be vulgar it might not be the most sophisticated but nonetheless it's part of the information war and we have to use every front possible united front tactics work and you don't have to sacrifice political independence to, to use united front tactics the KPA Day maintained its political independence as a party. And without the political independence of the KPA Day as, as a mass party, these kind of mass media operations wouldn't have been able to have the reach they did. But, you know, because of his independence, even in the time period where the KPA Day was failing at United Front Tactics, Munzenberg was able to utilize these tactics and and um, spread this massive um, communist subversion throughout society. Uh, be financially savvy. Don't be afraid to make money in order to keep operations financially solvent and capable of expansion. Quite frankly, we need to, uh, as, as Bukharin said, enrich ourselves, not be afraid to um, get good at business in order to ultimately abolish business. Um, avoid dogmatism and petty sectarianism. Have communist propaganda for a mass audience, but still keep it aesthetically highbrow and sophisticated. You know, we don't have to make things dumb and kitschy in order to have a mass audience. We can be intelligent and sophisticated, but still have mass appeal. And uh, uh, yeah, tactical flexibility and united front. It doesn't preclude political independence. We can create alliances with non-socialists or independent socialists and and still maintain our independence and, and still um, have these kind of tactical and political alliances and uh i think that is it thank you awesome thanks michael and i'm very briefly going to share in the chat uh the resources that carl mentioned in his presentation everyone should get those and folks feel uh, please feel free to put uh, any questions that you have in the q a uh spot because I'll turn to those uh, during our next bit. Uh, but first, uh, I want to bring in Lee. Uh, Lee, you're up and should be able to share your screen too. I think you can see that. Um, I want to thank both Michael and Carl for uh, 
walking us through some of the history of the use of uh, media and the emphasis on the fact that uh, the left, uh, every revolution needs its own media. That was true in Russia, Cuba, Nicaragua, um, Black Panther Party, the civil rights movement. Every social movement needs its own media. Well, and Lee, I'm sorry, we can't see your screen yet. I think you might need to oh, press you can't button. see my screen. Okay, well. There now we can go. you? Okay. Now we can. Yeah, thank you. All right. And I also want to thank the National Political Education Committee for inviting me to participate in this um, discussion. Um, I, I thought I would start with what is the contemporary status of uh, the media in the United States? I'm just listing a few, not all, of the companies, the media companies in the US. Obviously, Apple's at the top of the pile uh, with their technology, their cell phone, and now Apple Plus and their streaming. Um, I, I did not put every uh, social media company in there. Alphabet and Google's not there, even though they make $282 billion a year. Um, Disney, which we all recognize as one of the largest global media producers in the world, um, is only about 10% the size of Apple uh, when you get down to what the revenue they, they are able to uh, attract. Of course, Disney has ABC, they have films, they have parks, they have Disney Plus streaming, they have toys. Uh, Comcast is here, Netflix is here, which is one of the companies that started streaming and is very lucrative for them, $153 billion. I think it's interesting to look at Meta which has Instagram and other Facebook and other um, social media outlets, they are quite far down on the list to 134 billion. Of course, they're much more than uh, TikTok, which only makes about 16 billion a year. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I thought that I would start with a few. Uh, the Disney company, which is familiar to most of us, ABC, the Marvel movies, there's been 26 of them so far, Lucasfilm, Pixar. Uh, they recently bought 21st Century Fox uh, from the Murdoch family. They own 80% of ESPN. Uh, I assume many of you know that they also have a share in uh, Arts and Entertainment, the History Channel, Lifetime, and even Vice Media. Uh, they have franchises that are well known around the world. Star Wars, as I said, the Marvel Universe, all of the uh, princess animations from Cinderella to Mulan to uh, Frozen and Frozen 2. Um, the Pixar films, which include Toy Story, The Incredibles, and Cars. There and, and they also have many popular ABC shows. What we may not be aware of is the number of global partnerships that Disney has. They have a par major, major partnership with Grupo Globo in Brazil, which is the largest media company in Brazil. They also have a a Disney radio partnership in Bolivia. They have a joint venture with Vocenta in Spain uh, for Walt Disney Iberia. They have a partnership with Canadian Chorus Entertainment and with Sony Pictures. Patagonic Films, which uh, enters the uh, Academy Awards almost every year with foreign language films, is a partnership with the Claren Media Group, which is one of the largest media companies in uh, Latin America. And of course, they have co-productions with Shanghai Media, China Media Group, and other, Dali and Wanda, and other companies in China. Comcast Universal, as I said, I'm not going to go through each of these, but we know Comcast. It's what Carl started saying when, at the beginning, you would watch ABC, NBC, and CBS, and those are the ones that I'm looking at primarily here. But Comcast Universal, Comcast is a cable company, but they now own Universal, NBC, uh, DreamWorks Animation, Universal Pictures. They have a streaming service called Peacock. Again, they also have several franchises that are familiar to anybody that goes to the movies on a regular basis, from Jurassic Park and King Kong through Fast and Furious. And likewise, just like Disney, they have multiple global partnerships. In New Zealand, they are partnered with Sony Pictures. 
They have a joint venture with the Belga Home Video, which makes video productions for Europe. They strangely have a Korean joint venture that produces entertainment for South America. They have a joint venture with an Australian company called Madman Entertainment, Studio Canal Blue, and Lionsgate, which are joint ventures for Europe. And then there's also a separate one for uh, German and Germany and Austria. Paramount Global, which is a much smaller company compared to Disney and uh, Comcast Universal, but they still own CBS, MTV, Miramax, BET, Nickelodeon. Many of these are well known to all of us. They also have several franchises. They may not be as well known as some of the Disney or Universal franchises, but certainly people remember CSI, which is a TV show, the, the late show, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and others. And again, I'm trying to stress here that there are transnational partnerships. Paramount has a partnership with India's Reliance Media, which is the largest media company in India. They have an audience of 1.3 billion people. They have a partnership with MultiChoice, which uh, distributes uh, African magic and other African stations across most of the uh, subcontinent of, uh, of, South Af of Southern Africa. They have a partnership with a cable media provider in Japan. They have a partnership for TV distribution in Europe with Sky TV. And there's even a pending joint venture between Paramount Plus and Comcast's Peacock. I don't want to leave out the print media because it's huge. The Associated Press is the largest news agency in the world. On a daily basis, four, mil four billion people either read or view an Associated Press news story or video. The New York Times, on the other hand, only has 300,000 people reading the paper daily, but it has more than 9 million people that are online subscribers. The Wall Street Journal has twice as many readers, but only about a third of the number of online subscriptions, three and a half million. The point I would make here, going back to the question of social media, which I think the, the, the left and any social movement needs to use, it primarily is an aggregator. Social media does not create news. Social media primarily aggregates the news that are made by other commercial media outlets, whether that's ABC or CBS or the New York Times, which allows commercial media to frame the news, whether that's sanctions or war or U.S. intervention, Gaza, Venezuela, Ukraine, Ethiopia. I want to take a quick minute here to talk about media framing, because this speaks to the issue that Carl raised earlier, that we are all are born into an existing culture, an existing dominant culture, which influences us. And I would argue that that's largely influenced through the entertainment. But when we talk about news specifically, the media is in an extremely exceptional position. The commercial media is in an exceptional position to define events, diagnose the causes for those events, evaluate the participants, and then promote whatever uh, the, the government of the national media uh, seems to prefer for their actions. The techniques that were used, and I use Israel here as an example, they select the sources that they're going to use. In the case of uh, the war on Gaza, it's US, EU, and Israeli officials dominate. In fact, if you look at something like CNN or MSNBC, oftentimes it's 10 to 1 the number of uh, sources or officials that speak from the United States uh, compared to how many people might be speaking from uh, Palestine or the Mideast. The word choice, they use word choice to help evaluate the participants. In this case, it's almost always presented as Israel is a democratic self-defense country fighting against the Hamas or some other Palestinian or Arab terrorists. They identify who, which victims are worthy and which victims are unworthy. Um, we saw that in the case of the Ukraine when a CBS reporter said, how can this be happening in the Ukraine? They're white, blue-eyed Christians just like the rest of us, whereas all the people in Syria or the Congo are not worthy victims and they don't get reported in the newspaper. There's also outright censorship, which occurs on all of the media. 
even the ones that presumably seem to be uh, much more liberal like MSNBC or CNN. Um, and there's also attacks on free speech, including on college campuses. The biggest thing that they do is provide no historical context. The war on Gaza began on October 7th. They don't talk about 75 years of occupation and destruction and removal of the Palestinians. They don't talk about international law, the Rome Statute of 2000, or even the UN uh, Resolution of 242, uh, which said that you had to remove uh, the occupation of the West Bank uh, and the Golan Heights. I, I show this because it's a visual um, when we think about how uh, Musenberg might have done it. He may have used a visual like this uh, because it's pretty clear. Who's the, who's the aggressor here? This is Palestine on, the, on, your, on our left in 1946 before uh, Israel began its campaign of removing the Palestinians. And on the far right is what Israel looks like. And the little green spots are what remains of Palestine uh, today. The concluding point I would like to make is that you, news media frame and the entertainment media are complicit with those framing narratives. Media partnerships and joint ventures profit national media monopolies. The transnational media partnerships all share a global culture of capitalism. There is no such thing as, in my mind, anymore, cultural imperialism. It is essentially a combination of media from the United States, from, from Europe, from, from Africa, and from China. And I just listed a few of these, some of the media partnerships that exist um, across, across borders. Uh, Disney has uh, connections in each of these countries going down, as does Bertelman, as does Banerjee, as does Dali and Wanda and the China Media Group, as does Korean uh, media, as does Turkey. Mehdi Yapim and Ay Yapim are major, major producers and distributors of content in Latin America and in the Mideast. Um, the India group, Reliance Media, which owns DreamWorks, and they had a, in the last couple of years, they've had nominees for Academy Awards. Uh, we don't refer to that as Indian cultural imperialism, even though DreamWorks is an Indian-owned company. Uh, Brazil is Grupo Gobo, and Mexico is Televisa Univision. Um, I will be more than happy to take comments or, or questions. Um, in, in the discussion, but uh, I, I, I have a little bit different appreciation of social media than some of the others do. I don't think it's the democratic opening that it is hyped to be. It's owned by a handful of media conglomerates who can choose to block anything that you they want. They have algorithms, they have monitors that do this. In fact, um, the social media from Facebook to YouTube have shut down reports from Gaza, from Palestinian voices. So I, I think that it's right, both what Carl said and what uh, Michael said, that the left and social movements should use any social media available. So that means we should be able to use social media, but there's no replacement for the actions, for the actions the face-to-face -face interaction that social movements need to form to be able to be successful. Thank you. <laughs> thanks so much, Lee, and thanks to uh, the three of you for launching off that discussion. What I'll do now is turn to the two questions that we have in the chat, uh, or I should say the Q&A box. If folks have more Q&A questions, keep filling them in and we'll keep the conversation going uh, for about the next 25, 30 minutes or so. And I figure with these questions, I'll pose them. Um, some of them you know, might be up some folks' alley more than others. Um, and I'll let our panelists respond as they'd like. So the first question that we have is um, focused on DSA in particular. 
And that question is, what obstacles does DSA face in expanding its media presence? How has the editorial board operated since it was passed at convention? And how does it plan to carry on its work? Uh, Michael, I, I know you're on the editorial board. Do you want to maybe kick us off and then um, Lee and Carl, you all can can come in too? Yeah, I can yeah. speak to that one especially. <clears throat> what obstacles does DSA face in expanding its media presence? Well, I think this is an easy one. It's quite frankly money. I think uh, if anyone who's been paying attention to national DSA politics knows that we are in a budget crisis. Democratic Left used to be a print publication that was mailed out to every DSA member. That is no longer the case. We got all our funding cut. So now we are going to be an online only publication for the foreseeable future. Uh, this is obviously not ideal. Uh, it's absolutely heartbreaking that this had to happen, but um, you know, it's austerity time. Everyone's got to take cuts. So you know, we'll take it. We'll work from here and do what we can. So since we, uh, you know, knew for sure that the print publication was being cut for good. We've essentially been trying to re-envision how we're going to um, make our online presence stronger. Uh, so how does the editorial board operate? Um, well, it's um, there's an editorial board that's for all of the DSA publications that was um, determined by the MPC, I believe. And there's two subcommittees, one for Socialist Forum, one for Democratic Left. With I am on the Democratic Left subcommittee, and we meet every week on Monday. And we uh, go over what stories we're working on, what we've got in the uh, inbox, uh, what pitches we're you know, working on, um, what we'd like to see people write about. Uh, and um, so... How do we plan to um, carry on? I think we're still kind of um, figuring out how to just get our publication running on a, on a regular basis on as a non-print publication for now. We have been talking about actually uh, making, um, making it so that individual chapters can print their own um, smaller, like kind of like um, a bridge to Democratic lefts that we can kind of use those to hand out and stuff at rallies and not own tabling. So, you know, given that, you know, we're not going to be able to print and mail to everyone, at least, you know, we'll be able to have some kind of situation where, uh, you know, a chapter can invest its own funds in the printing something that it can hand out the very least, but hopefully we will get our funding situation in order and we can start bringing funding into a uh, democratic left and socialist forum and really, um, expanding these publications and how much we publish. I think regardless with DSA, you have a lot of potential for volunteer labor. There's a lot of really smart people, a lot of very uh, hardworking people in DSA who are more than happy to put their free time into uh, making an excellent online newspaper. And we've got some really cool stories in the work right now. So we're going to make the most of the situation. I think, uh, you know, Given the plans that I've talked about, I think we are making the most of the situation we have. But I'd be lying if I said it isn't a little sad that we lost the print issue. And uh, I think hopefully it will be reborn better than ever. Does that wanna, answer the question? I want to push back a little bit. Um, I don't think your main problem is money. Okay. Uh, uh, I think what you have to do is you have the most important thing already, which is you have a list. You must have an email list of what, how many, 50,000 DSA? No, members. yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's no short, like I said, there's no shortage of good people. Uh, okay. The only work. thing you have to do is blatantly copy LA Progressive or even the PSL's online newspaper, either one of them. They're, both of them are nicely done. Just blatantly steal them and then start putting content into it. And I'll tell you the secret to get content. People will write for you for nothing when they can see their byline. 
That is true. Don't okay. ask me how I know. And you must have, you know, you must have a thousand people in DSA that are willing to write articles for you. What you need is to organize a good editorial board. Forget about print copies. Instead of print copies, print business cards, a hundred thousand of them or more. You can get them for $500 for $12 from Instaprint in a huge quantity. You can get even less. And then instead of selling papers or handy, just have every one of your members pass around the business cards with all the links on them to where your online newspapers are. So you don't really need all that much money. Maybe you need to pay one or two people to do this or take a couple people who are on salary already and assign them to this without hiring anybody else. But I don't think your main problem is money. Uh, I mean, it is. I'm, I possibly am speaking from a position of, you know, <laughs> disappointment with everything being cut, you know. But I think, you know, like you said, there is there is a lot we can do with the resources we have. And I think um, when you say copy PSL, though, what do you mean per se? Like copy the content no, or? No, of course not the content, just the okay. form of it. It's nicely okay, laid okay, out. Yeah, that makes I mean, I, I disagree with this politics altogether, but it's nicely laid out. Yes, same, that is true. Same with uh, LA Progressive or Hollywood Progressive, either version of it. Nicely done up. And you can uh, and change the articles every day. You have a daily online newspaper. A, a bigger answer to what obstacles are faced is that we live in a country that the monopoly over media is corporate owned. That's the biggest obstacle. That's the number right. one biggest obstacle for any movement. How do you reach members? How do you reach larger audiences? Um, and that's, I don't think that that's insurmountable, but you have to find creative ways to do that. I mean, the whole thing that Michael presented earlier about how it was done in Germany, it, it offers those kinds of suggestions. So I, I, I also think even social media is not necessarily the answer. Um, I like the idea of taking 50,000 people that have emails. Why not email everybody every week with a publication? I mean, I don't think that that's an impossible thing to do. And that's very difficult to interrupt. But you can be interrupted because I know that Mint Press, Counterpunch, Mondo Weiss, Black Agenda Report have all lost their their or had their sites moved down when you do a Google search so that it's not there for most people when they type in, you don't, you can't find it. But nobody's stopping you from sending an email out to 50,000 people. I mean, you may have to do it in batches, but that's not a money problem. That's simply a technical problem. And uh, I mean, in the long run, the only future is when the public owns the media like in Venezuela or Bolivia. It's a totally different, it's a different way of, of, of running the media. And as long as the media is corporate owned and monopolized in the US, it's always gonna be a problem. I appreciate this back and forth in terms of thinking about strategies and obstacles. Right, you know, I will say in defense of the idea that money is an issue, I think we are never going to be able to economically outcompete the media monopolies, at least until we have state power of some kind, probably. But I do think if you really want to be able to have a counter hegemonic threat to these institutions, you are going to need money because, you know, yeah, we can get an online paper going relatively cheaply, but what about all the other stuff we need to be doing? You know, we need to have, we need to be waging a multi front media campaign here and i think you know if 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 money isn't as much of a worry it becomes a lot easier but ultimately politics needs to be the central thing i'll give you another suggestion it's based on a story from sds days back in the sds days we were plagued by reporters who wanted to talk to us and we didn't want to talk to any of them we just denounced them all as the bourgeois press mainly because <laughs> they had burned us once in a New York Times article early on. So, so, but they always came around anyway. So there was one person willing to talk to them was Marilyn Katz. She, I, uh, she's passed recently and I attended her memorial. But 
she was a, a street fighter originally. She was very good at it. And uh, But uh, she would talk to the press. So whenever these people would come around to us, we'd say, go talk to Marilyn. That was our across the board answer. Shoo, shoo away from here and go talk to Marilyn. Well, what Marilyn did is she eventually built that into a very successful PR firm that helped Carol Mosley Brown get elected to the Senate, to help Harold Washington get elected uh, to mayor of Chicago. And I'll tell you, the I was her computer guy for many, many years, so I know how her operation operated. And you can do a lot of it. What you have to do is build a database of, say, you're operating in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. You have to build a database of every media person and their email number and their fax number. Just build a, just, you know, go on and online and search for them and get them and build a huge database. This was the core to Maryland's business. And then you keep track of them. Anytime they publish anything, you categorize them. So if you want to influence somebody on some issue, you immediately can call up a hundred different writers or uh, uh, media people or whatever in your area who are specialized on that topic. And you can email them, give them fresh uh, material, fresh pictures and whatnot, that they are starving for to write their articles. And that's the way you do it. And again, it doesn't cost that much. It costs just the time to build the database originally. That's the way, that's the way she did it. I, I also would encourage uh, the use of the existing media. That's that's uh, what I'm I, talking about, been, the existing media. I, yeah, the existing media. I've been working with Palestine, Palestinian Solidarity in Northwest Indiana, which is not a, exactly a hotbed of activity. But we've had coverage uh, in the Northwest Indiana Times. We've had coverage in the Laporte Herald Argus. We've had coverage in uh, Lakeshore PBS. Um, because we have contacts with those people and they appreciate the stories that we send them. They're, the press releases that we send sometimes are published almost word for word. So you, you, I think Carl's right. If you have a, a friendly or a responsive reporter that may not necessarily be leftish, but accepts the fact that you can write a decent press release and they they accept that it's legitimate, the evidence that you present or the quotes that you present are accurate, you're gonna get coverage. And we've we've received huge coverage. Uh, everything all, through, all the way from South Bend to uh, Gary and Maryville, Indiana. I mean, that's, a, that's it's quite significant. Here's so, the trick. Once say you're doing stuff on, on Gaza, you know, every reporter knows uh, got to beat on Gaza, but what every reporter on a local paper needs is what they call local color. Yep. So what you have to do is fax them, you know, you watch the news, what's the main development in Gaza today, what's hitting the news, what problems is by and so what you do is you provide them local color. Here's so here's Barry Romo from Vietnam Bets Against the War and He's, uh, this is what he had to say in response to what Biden uh, did yesterday. And you give them the local color. And once they have the local color, your rest of your press release is probably going to be printed too, along with it, because that's what they need most. I want to flip us back to the Q&A channel here, and folks can keep coming on <laughs> in. I don't think we'll have time for all of these, but I think there's some way to perhaps bundle them in together. This next question, I think, is related to everything we've been talking about. The ultimate question is, you know, what's a strategy to create left and or progressive media with those comparable in scale to the right media? Some uh, ones to uh, admire are listed as Amy Goodman, The Nation, Mother Jones, uh, so on and so forth. I would imagine that everything we're talking about is related to doing just that. Um but this is, is certainly a comment about just scales of size <laughs> and, and magnitude. I'm going to bring in a, a few other voices, I think, before I, I, I return to some of these anonymous uh, ETND questions, though I do like these. Jerry is asking us about the United Front. Um, he asked specifically about online University of the Left and, and left links as a United Front media source for DSA and others to do what Liberation News Services uh, did before. Um, so that's an interesting question, perhaps. The United Front, it, it also 
brings in something I was sort of curious about the the connecting with other people who might not call themselves socialists or even members of the DSA. How can they be brought in? Um, yeah, curious if folks have have thoughts about that United Front bringing in other folks. Well, you know, for for left links, it's uh, I just pick from the from the from the regular press, you know, and, and the various opinion journals things that I think are consistent with our interests on not necessarily on every point, but on a on a few points, and that way I aggregate the things uh, from the you know from the bourgeois press, you, you know, used broadly. I aggregate them so that I end up with a publication that gives you a, a quick rundown each week of what you uh, of interesting things that you might need to know. That's the idea behind it. It's not a party organ in that sense. If I tried to publish that back in the day, I'd probably be, uh, you know, denounced as a revisionist, <laughs> one sort or another. <laughs> but uh, it actually uh, makes for a pretty interesting weekly journal. And Carl, maybe if I can just piggyback off that, because someone else asked, how do we start to aggregate local and news content we're already developing? And forgive me, aggregate meaning pull it all into one source? Can you can you yeah. talk a little bit more about that? Well, for instance, the online university of the left is a portal. It's a web portal and uh, organized as a, as a university with all its different departments. So I just, you know, search around there. I got 50 people to help me in the beginning. Now I have about five people helping me. The, the other 50 are still there. They're just more passive. But uh, so I just I got them to send me things, you know, uh, either videos of their classes, you know, for the, you know, a lot of the departments are in, say, uh, English department, somebody lecturing on English or history department, somebody lecturing on Du Bois' Black Reconstruction. Now, they're, they're all mostly, most of them are YouTube, some are not. And then in, in the print versions, I have an whole archive section where I put PowerPoints and uh, and other documents that you would use in study groups on every question under the sun. And then uh, I have places where, where we've made them on our own, where we've had uh, forums or uh, gatherings of some sort or another and jointly produced certain things, you know, uh, co you know copies of Zoom uh, sessions that we've had. And book sections, I, I find... Uh, you know, PDFs online of various books that are rare or hard to get up. So you can go to our book section. You can download the books for free. And uh, so on and on and on. So it just, it, it's like, a, it has like a library. It has study guides. It has uh, print resources. Archives have, uh, if you want Deng Xiaoping archive, you want the Stalin archive, you want the Trotsky archive, you want the anarchist archive. It's eclectic in that sense. I'm, I'm not I mean, obviously, it, it reflects my own views to a certain extent. I'm a big guy on Gramsci, so you'll find a lot of stuff on there about Gramsci. But I, I let everybody, so there's something in there for everybody. So that makes it a unit, a left unity project. But more than that, it, it can reach out to a broader. The only people who really hate it are the far right. I have, you know, until, and, and, uh, Lee is very right about this. Facebook made a major change. Early on, I used Facebook to build it. I got over 10,000 people to sign on for daily updates to the online university left just using Facebook. Now, uh, Facebook's algorithm has changed. I, I, I get very little to build it off Facebook. I have to find other outlets. And Facebook, I get maybe one or two responses uh, on the different Facebook messages I send out. They've shoved me way, way down for some, you know, you know, probably for political reasons. I like Carl talking about Gramsci because I think Gramsci provides us with a model. Um, the, the early journal that he worked on, um, he said the need was to create consent among the working class and their allies. And he proceeded to do that. He'd have everything from a review of a puppeteer to a review of a movie to a critique of uh, the, the Communist Party in Italy. So I, I, somebody in here says, why not hook up with Jacobin in these times, catalysts, left links, et cetera. That may not be possible given each organization's politics. But on the other hand, it would seem like there would be a place for uh, sharing of ideas and sharing of, uh, of, of articles. And you also are tapping into that broader left rather than simply DSA members, even though you may have 50,000 emails, if you also tap into the 
uh, the broader left, you you have that many more. And if there's a journal or there's a publication, whether it's online or in print, that is available to that broader left to debate those ideas, I think that would be very attractive. It would, and and as Carl said, that's what that's how Gramsci that's how Gramsci started, right? It's he was very good at uh, being a theater critic because he did something unique. Instead of just watching the play, he turned around and watched the audience. And so he wrote all his, he noted all the reactions of the work. It was mainly workers in the audience. Workers went to theater in Italy in those days. And he would, he would record all their, their hoots and comments and things that they would, he would record all of those. And so that when he wrote his reviews, it wasn't just about his idea about what was going on on the stage. He presented it as a dialogue between the working class and struggle back and forth around the ideas being presented and the worker's response to them. And that's, that was unique about how he wrote his reviews and uh, it made them quite popular. One thing I wanted to ask about, and then I'm aware that we'll probably just do one more question after this one. It's phrased at least by the, the question answer about a distinction, if any, that you see between media for already activated radicals and then quote unquote mass media, and then how do they relate? And it makes me think about a question, I think it's uh, connected to what this person has in mind, between um, who, who you're talking to, so to speak. Um, perhaps when, you know, if you have infinite resources, perhaps you can have something that talks to folks who uh, are novices and, and, and folks who know a whole lot about something. If your resources are limited, are you speaking more towards the people who uh, get, you know, are, are at a certain level or are you trying to build people up to a certain level? Um, yeah, how are you thinking about your audience? Well, I, th I think that there are two ways to look at it. The most important way is when I develop things, I think my audience is the young people in DSA. Why? Because I think the most important task now is to develop the modern prince and to develop the modern prince, the revolutionary organization. You have to develop, you know, organic intellectuals of the working class. And that's what DSA is. I had 12 of the 16 DSAers come to my house for a weekend. I said, at the end, I'm going to tell you what you are. And in the beginning, they all told me, you know, they basically came from working class backgrounds. At the end of the session, I said, you're, and they said, well, who are we? I said, you are the, the budding organic intellectuals of a rising precariat. And so what I want to do, the main thing I want to do in the things that I do is to help them become more politically conscious and more politically astute. But having said that, there's also a role, and this is the importance of doing what Maryland did, studying the mass media, the existing one, because there are ways, if you uh, work at it, in, in somewhat sophisticated ways, you can get your messages and you can get your op-ed pieces printed. You can influence a certain, you know, a, a certain reporter to do something that they m m might not normally do. So that helps you reach a much broader audience with maybe just a, a single agitational speech. But what we do with the, uh, you know, uh, the people close in, say the, the people like uh, DSA's membership, is you. You're there, you're doing propaganda work. You're taking very complicated ideas to make them much, much clearer to a relatively smaller number of people. Propaganda I'm using here in Lenin's sense, not as a pejorative, but as a, a way of describing uh, a different uh, pedagogical technique. I, uh, I, I agree with, well, I agree with Carl, but yeah. I think that one of the things that you also have an obligation to do is not simply to appeal to the members that are and how to train them up and raise their consciousness, but they also have to know how to talk to other people. Right. So part of it is not just writing an essay or an article that educates me or you or the 50,000 members of DSA, but to present to them how it is possible to talk to other people that don't already agree with you or you have a difference with. And you have to be able to demonstrate that as well. So I think it's the the the, the distinction between uh, mass media and activist media. I think is not as sh as sharp as it uh, that one might think. 
because you can appeal to activists by demonstrating how to appeal to the larger audience. I mean, how do you talk to your coworkers in an auto plant or a steel plant, right? And many of us have been through that. And some are more successful at it than others. Well, why can't some? Because if you immediately start talking about Lenin or what Engels and Trotz, uh, Marx wrote in the German ideology, I mean, whoa, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but if you talk about John Brown, or you talk about Malcolm X, or you talk about right Harriet Tubman, you're going to get a little bit better response. Or if you talk, I mean, even if you talk about the UAW strike recently. That's a way to begin the conversation about why do we need labor solidarity. So right. I'm, I'm I'm not disagreeing with Carl. I'm just trying to open it up a little bit. To I agree have with that you. And the best thing you to do, talk to somebody. The best thing to do is start by asking questions. In today's uh, lingo, we call it deep canvassing. In in, in the old left way, it was called the practice of the mass line. <laughs> but the main thing you have to do is ask questions and keep asking questions until our conflicted consciousness can, can merge. I think the whole idea of false consciousness needs to be thrown in a wastebasket. We have conflicted consciousness and we are on a par with people we want to reach. But I would say one last thing. If you're not uncomfortable in dealing with people, you're not doing it right. You're already united with the people you're comfortable with. You want to get out and talk to people you're not uh, in agreement with. So you want to get out to where you're uncomfortable. If you're feeling uncomfortable, you're doing the right thing. Michael, I just really wanted to um, quickly pose this question to you, too, and thinking about maybe how you approach your work in DSA, also Cosmonaut, uh, thinking about your audience, so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, Cosmonaut you know, is is a publication that is for people who already consider themselves Marxist or part of the left. And, you know, we have no doubt that, you know, that's our audience. And, you know, and really what we're trying to do is get Marxists to talk to each other and engage in dialogue and um, kind of see past sectarian, petty, ideological blinders and actually engage in dialogue as Marxists about issues of theory, strategy, et cetera. Democratic left is very different, you know. We are trying to bring a socialist perspective to current events and educate uh, not just, you know, DSA members, but people outside DSA might be curious. And, you know, we're also very much about just, you know, keeping people up to date about what's going on in the organization, what's happening, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day level with the organization. So... Yeah, very, very different, I think, purposes, but I think they 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 don't have to be um opposed to each other. And you know, like I said, you have different publications for different audiences, you have a multi-pronged approach. You have, you know, publications for people who are already part of the left and already organizing and theorizing, et cetera, to sharpen their analysis, sharpen their strategy, engage in dialogue on that level. And you have publications that are about just getting a, a socialist analysis and a socialist message out to the masses, out to the rank and file of organizations, and you know, kind of creating a common narrative that uh, an organization can unite around, but also, you know, something for the public to experience. And so I think, you know, the two definitely are very different, but I think um, one of the reasons why I was excited about moving on to them left was because it was kind of different from what I was used to with Cosmo, which is more of a, it's more for people who are already into Marxism and already invested in these debates. Well, we've uh, come up to our 90 minute period and crossed over a little bit. <laughs> this is of course only just the uh, beginning or can only be the the beginning of the conversation. I know I know Lee and and Carl and and Michael are uh, public figures, and I, and I'm sure would have no problem continuing the conversation and in, in various spaces. Um, and we can continue to think about how NPEC uh, not only can continue the conversation, have folks on in the future, so on and so forth. And all of these media operations continue. Uh, you know, we've had folks on who are talking about ongoing 
media projects. Uh, so things that, that folks can either write for or write to or express their feelings about, so on and so forth. So I wanted to uh, very uh, much thank our, our guests, Lee, Carl, Michael, encourage people to check out uh, NPEC, the National Political Education Committee of DSA. Also check out DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, and check out uh, all the work that Lee, Carl, and Michael have done. And I'll be in communication with our panelists afterwards too, if there's any resources they wanna share with folks, um, because I can email you all through the Action Network link too. So thanks thank very you very much for having me. Well, thanks, for, thanks, um, thanks, Luke, for putting this together. It was great. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thanks. Good, Good to see you. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye.